we are good to go now. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to another session in your PCL 102 philosophical questions of the second semester of 2023. This is City Campus class group one, but we intend to hopefully share content that we have here to the other sites and other campuses if the need arises. My name is Dr. Nancy Miles Bafojin P. I am a senior lecturer in the Department of Philosophy and Classics of the University of Ghana School of Arts, College of Humanities. The course is philosophy. We are in our sixth week together. It's the sixth week of a 10 week semester. I hope students are preparing to do their interim assessments which for level 100, I think is worth 30 marks or so. You can check your course outline. We've done some in-class assessments. We've done some online assessments. If you look at your course outline, you know what that means. We are using them together with your, with your interim assessment to compute your 50 marks out of the 100. See, Then the final exam will do 50 marks. And then you total both to give you you're over 100. You know the grading scale and all. Okay, so I want you to be minded. This is the second half of the semester. And so your posture has to be right. Your attitude towards the content and your understanding of the mode of delivery and what is expected of you for this half should be a bit more you know, engaging than it was for the first half. Think of football, <laughs> be on the football field. If by the first half you haven't scored a goal and it's a very you know difficult match and you have a lot at stake then your posture should be right okay so we have had this discussion already but i just want you to have something that you can reference in your revision on the topic since we had this topic for all the campuses and groups of the various campuses we had them in person maybe the recording should should save some of you right okay just take note that the, the slides were prepared in august 2022 but our discussion is in 2023 now so this is as recent as can be the topic was moral standards are they abs absolute or relative and then do we look out for the consequences of an action to determine whether it is right or wrong or we are focused on the rule the moral rule that guided the action do we look at the outcomes or we focus on the rule? Okay, and because we want it to have a concretized, you know, meaningful understanding of the concept, we will put it in the context of business. So we'll do a reflection on these principles, but we will do it in an applied mood. So we'll be connecting the discussion to the business setting. We're discussing is the question of right and wrong, good and bad ethics. Okay? But we will be reflecting on business. The first half of our discussion in ethics, you saw that reflected on medicine, medical practice, the question of informed consent, autonomy, beneficence, non-maleficence, you know, patient confidentiality, all bordering on what right action you would embark on given the tensions that may arise ethically in pursuing the, or protecting preserving the autonomy of the patient and yet ensuring beneficence and non-maleficence we did all that see that the key thing in our first part of the ethics was what ensuring informed consent and i said that principle doesn't have to be restricted to only medical practice. It goes into your research. Before people give their consent for you to enter into, say, their traditional setting and look at what their gods are and you know, their belief systems and what have you are, you have to make sure they are clear in their minds about what information they are giving you, the risk that they stand to either, uh, 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 the, the risk they have, you know, what is the risk around it? What are the benefits for that? Maybe if we expose all these traditions that we have, it helps us attract a certain kind of NGO help or developmental attention and stuff like that. They, those may be the benefits, but there could also be the risk of what people denigrating that culture, looking down on them. Even maybe people fearing that they can't then marry from such a place or they can't do their businesses there. Those are possible risks. And as a researcher, 
you would have to point both out, show the strengths, show the weaknesses, give alternative ways, and then let the, the respondent, the one whose view you want, make the decision, decide whether they are willing mm -hmm. to consent to your research, you see. So it's not just in medical practice where uh, it becomes necessary to seek informed consent. We can apply it to different contexts, but for the meaningfulness of those concepts, we specialize somewhere. And that's what we are doing here also. Understanding moral standards and knowing whether they are absolute or relative, <clears throat> excuse me, whether they are objective or subjective, whether they are universal or you know, concretized or localized doesn't have to only apply, all these understandings, doesn't have to only apply in the business setting. You see, whether we look at the consequences of our decision or the rule, the moral rule guiding our decision, must not only be about when you are doing business. It can also be about if we are allocating resources in the nation, governance, see that. Would the decision making at the high level of government focus on the consequences or it will focus on whether it is the right thing to do. See, so it doesn't have to be business. It can be international relations. It can be World Health Organization deciding whether to you know, give vaccines for COVID, for example, to reduce death or let people build immunity by themselves and let quite a, a few people die. You see, these are decisions that are either detecting, uh, you know, determined by the consequences of the action or the rule, and it, they may not necessarily be business, just so you have a wider view of what we are doing. So we saw in our discussions that traditionally, see, so these are, these are outlined, these are key things when you finish the whole discussion, you should have absolutism, objectivism, uh, look at the isms, relativism, uh, the cultural one and the ethical one, they are all there. What are they trying to tell you? So we saw that traditionally, now my screen, keep looking, I've heard all that I'm saying. We are going to move to the next topic. But I want to mop up nicely. So you are doing your revision alongside learning new things. Your eye will cover everything we've done. Okay, first you do your assignments and then you make sure you have the in-class assessment. I think I've done about two or three per, per group, which we will add. To you. I, I said that earlier, you strike an average, uh, an average uh, 50% of that from everything you've done. See, so if you are doing all assessments, you have a higher chance, okay, of doing well over the 50, then your exam is also over 50. Now, we learned that moral standards are traditionally considered to be absolute. Look on, your, on my screen. They are objective and they are universal. It is the traditional way of thinking about ethics. We believe, when I say we, humanity believes that there are objective, universal, absolute standards. See the word, a principle, a standard, something we appeal to beyond what our local context. There should be a higher standard that what societies, religions, political parties, families, universities, ethnic groups, whatever. You see different local contexts appeal to that standard would have to be high up there and constitute that which we appeal to to determine what is right, what is wrong, good or bad. Now the absolutist view or the objectivist view or the universalist view is capturing the same thing. But the emphasis is different. So I said in class, I'm called Nancy, because that's my first name. I'm called Miles, because that's my father's name that he gave me. I'm called Bafo Jemfi, that's my husband's name. So if you address the Bafo Jemfi, you are talking to the Nancy who is married to Bright. If you address the Miles, you are talking to the Nancy who is Uncle Bo's daughter. You see the point. Now, if you get that, then look on your screen. If I describe this view as objectivist, I'm talking about this traditional view of morality as the view which says what? That there are right and wrong standards that are not dependent on the subject. It doesn't depend on who is speaking. 
is objective. So you are talking about something about that view, which what are you talking about that view? You are, you are saying that the view is objective. So you are saying there are standards that are object oriented. They look at the thing, not the one speaking. So the objectivists is the same as the universalist, the universalist. But when I say universalist, I'm describing something else about that same view. What is it that the, the view says such standards apply everywhere. You see the point? So there is not talking about the fact that it is objective and not subjective. It is not talking about that side of the view which says what? Oh, that view is applicable everywhere. It's universal. So we don't care about the epoch in question, the civilization, the nation, the ethnic group, everywhere. So the universality of that view is about the fact that it applies everywhere. The objectivism of that view is the fact that it is not dependent on a subject. The subject is the person. Okay, it is, it is about the view itself. So killing is wrong in itself. It's not because of the one feeling the killing or it's not because of a certain person's point of view. It's objective, not subjective. Universally applicable means it applies everywhere. We are still describing the same traditional view of morality. Just like you were describing the same me, but when you call me Miles, it is because you are referencing my father's name that he gave you. Send. You see that? And if you call me Mrs. Balfour GMP, then you are focusing on the, the wifeness in me, referencing my husband. You see that? And then some, some maybe say, Amma, that will be still me. So the view hasn't changed. It's the same thing. Just that you are talking about, uh, because of the nature of questions I've asked you, that's why I'm emphasizing that. I would have gone along. Okay. The Amma would be the day Nancy was born. So if you say Amma, then you want to talk about the same view, but you, you are referencing the day of birth in the Akan traditional setting. Now, when then do we say it's absolutist? Absolute, it's high up. It's not localized. It's still the same, but see how I'm saying, it's a high standard. It's not the one that you can let go. It's an absolute, you know, principle. So the absolutist is also the objectivist, who is also the universalist. But we use the labels when we are referencing different interpretations of that view. Now, what did we say? It is a view that, keep your hand up, those who read. When I get to the place I want you to read, you read it. The view that the standards by which we judge actions or behaviors as right or wrong, good or bad, are universally applicable. That I'm talking about its universalism. Okay, and it's just independent of us. I'm talking about its objectivism. Whether we are there to, to, to judge it or not, killing is wrong, even if there was no human being on earth to know it. It is objective, it's not the subject that makes it so. It is true regardless of the subject. Independently of us, it will still be true that killing is wrong. Still be true that uh, lying is wrong. You see, that's objective. It's about the object, not us. In other words, there are moral standards, look at the screen, that apply to all people, irrespective of their color. All that I've seen there is touching on what the universalism of the view. Then I explained that absolutism is high. It's absolute or should be mood. It's high. It's not a, a local, a local, local, you know, easy, easy going like. Like you decide the food you want to eat or not. It's not about food and greeting and what have you. The universalist is focusing on standards that are high there, that really ground our being. When they talk about those moral standards that they call absolute, they are referring to high moral standards. Like killing is wrong, like stealing, like abortion is evil, like you shouldn't euthanasia is not acceptable. You see, when we are speaking, those high standards, absolutism captures that. Now, this view, which says that there are such, uh, you know, principles that are so high, you can't rubbish them, absolutism, that they are so applicable everywhere, you can't have it differently at your place, universalism, that they are objective and not subjective. This view is what has been challenged. There we go on my slide now. I'm going to trot mm, by the emotivists. 
the subjectivist and the relativist, they all challenged that view. And immediately, I would want to tell you that when you hear relativist, you are not talking cultural relativism. That doesn't challenge the view. That is an obvious. You can't disagree with the cultural relativist. What is the cultural relativist view then? Cultural relativism is only describing what is the case. What is the case? It is obvious that cultures don't live the same. People don't live the same everywhere. Some eat certain kinds of food and clothe themselves in a certain way that others don't. Because even the natural conditions are not the same. Clothing in the certain areas are not the same as how we clothe here. What we consider valuable ways of living vary. Some respect the space and privacy of people so much so that they won't even collect your bag without your invitation. If you invite them to, and they are able to, they can help you. If not, you will carry the load. Not because people are not helpful to each other, because people respect your space. So certain cultural settings will endorse some behaviors that others want. The difference in cultures, therefore, is not in contention. It's relativism of culture. Now, when you transfer that empirical fact of difference, cultural difference, to mean, there goes the one that a lot of us raise objection against. I'm going to show you that. When you change that to mean that therefore, what is right or wrong should be determined by cultures, then that generates another kind of relativism. You are no longer describing you said it should be dependent on the culture when it comes to what is ethically acceptable or not. Should is no longer a description. It has now become a prescription. You are saying that it is okay for cultures to determine what is right or wrong. That is problematic. You can't say in Ghana, you know, people study under trees. Therefore, people should study under trees. See the difference? We are describing how things are. That Ligon students pay you, pay you now. That's, that's what we are doing at Ligon now because, because of the numbers. Blah, 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 blah. Then someone says, ah, but that is not right. They say, hey, please don't talk about it. That is how we do things. The question is, should you be allowed to do things that way just because that is how you do things? One is a question of should, and I emphasize that in class, the normative. The other one is a question of is. You are just describing what is the case, differences. So one culture may say at three years, a girl can be betrothed to a man that she has never met. Three years, become the wife or husband of each other. When you turn 18, but you didn't have a choice in that. That culture may think that's okay. Let your parents make the decision for you. Now that is how they behave. That is how that culture behaves. Another does it. Just like you eat rat, and another person eats lizard, and someone eats frog, and it's fine. Differences. But when we say ethical relativism, the third uh, challenge, yeah? the first one is emotivism, the second one is something. The third challenge, those who are challenging the universalist view, is what I'm capturing in, in very simple terms for you to be able to put down some records, okay? The question is, when you confuse the differences in culture, which is a matter of fact, the, the natural, and you make it look, therefore, that it should be the norm, the normative, you are now not talking cultural relativism. You are talking ethical relativism. You are saying what is right or wrong to should be relative to culture, religion, uh, what have you. Now, that is problematic, friends. That will generate a big problem. So both emotivist, subjectivist, and then now I've just added the ethical relativist views are challenging or objecting toward the absolutism of values. But do they succeed? I went ahead because I don't want you to confuse ethical relativism with cultural relativism and think that, oh, but oh, cultures are different. But yeah, cultures are different. It's only stating what is obvious, which no human mind with its sort would critique. Cultures are different. But should right and wrong be different? We'll see the challenges we can have. So, so now to the very details of each one of them, as much as we can recap and help you put down. We have done this topic already. <laughs> so I'm virtually doing 
you like uh, summation of it so I can solicit your views and if you have queries I can do before we go to the cards. Good. Now, so see, the motive is say what? When you make moral claims, you are not stating any fact. You're not saying anything that can be true or false. It is just your feelings you're expressing. Feelings. Like you're saying, ouch. And so it's not something you should give attention to. Why do they say that? The emotive says, if you tell me it is wrong to kill, for example, eh, a human being, they will tell you the statement, it is wrong to kill a human being, captures your feelings. It's just how you feel about it. Or oh, abortion is wrong. This is when I look outside and people are killing a human being. I don't see wrong. Look at the, what, how they rationalized. They were logical positivists. I don't see wrong when I look outside. What I see is what people killing. That way I can see, I see someone maybe holding a knife and slashing the neck of the other person. God forbid, you shouldn't see that. Grand, I'm a grand pingu. But he's saying, when I turn and look, I don't see wrong or right. I see someone killing. Wrong or right is what I feel about what they are doing. See how they come by their emotive. It's your emotion towards it. You ask the soldier if he feels that way. The soldier, like the soldier who is defending himself against that other killer who has gotten and is holding the gun and shooting, pull, pull, pull into the guy's head, whether he feels the way you are feeling, says the emotivist. It's a matter of feeling, they say. So questions of right, wrong, good, bad, emotivist say, look, throw them all out. I said they were logical positivists. When you, maybe when you advance a little, you see what it is. They were, they were doing analysis of language, which made them throw out uh, claims that cannot be directly verified and claims that cannot be analyzed to determine their truth value. All this may be too high up for you, but just take note. They say it's just your feeling. So if you say uh, 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 lying is wrong, you say, I hear the person lying. I don't, I don't see, I hear or see or touch or taste the person doing an act. I don't see the wrong. I don't see, when I observe, my eyes doesn't see wrong or right. It's what I make of there that actually. So it's my feeling towards it, says the emotivist. They say treat claims like that are not still as if as feelings. Feelings too, they are not stable. I mean, how I feel, this minute you can be fine, the next thing I do. So he says you are not even stating a fact at all. It's just feelings you are expressing. Like you have you feel hungry or you feel hunger or something. Feelings. That's all. It's not even a factual statement. That means. Moral claims do not have a truth value. Now, what challenge do we have? Look at this critically. You may have a right feeling about something. It doesn't make it right. If you feel right about, about committing murder, I told you, the soldier who, like, let's say Zelensky and Putin's soldiers meet, and one is shooting the other. You think he feels bad about it. He feels all right. That's why he's doing it. But as it, does feeling right mean that thing is right? Over to you, Joe Latte, too. A moral judgment, when we say, oh, why did you rape the girl? It is based on the assumption that that is not right, objectively. If it is the feelings of the brother, then it's right for the brother to rape the sister. What about the sister's feeling, which is not right? It doesn't like the rape. Whose feelings now rules? See how crazy it will Feelings? There are no moral judgments. How do we run society and keep people in check? I feel that your car is fine. So I push you out of the car. And pushing you out of the car, I feel good about <laughs> your falling die high. It sounded to me. Like over it. So you feel like it sounded to me. And I think it feels right. So I, I pull you out of your car and I drive the car off. And I feel right about that, that stealing and the murder and everything. I, just because I feel right about it is right. Really? That's the critique. They are assertions that can be true or false. Hey, they are assertions that can be true or false. Why? No, no, we are saying that moral judgment, yeah, okay. So moral judgment are something that can be true or false, not like the, the emotivist wants us to think that they are not stating truth, anything that are true or false, okay? When we engage in moral argument, where we appeal to moral principles to support our moral claims or judgment, they are not mere emotion. That's the whole point. So if I say you shouldn't have 
murdered that guy at the law court. It is because I'm stating something that can be true, of course. That's actually cheek. It's not just mere feelings. How do we run society, friends? Just think about it. <laughs> huh? Why? Who would go to school? For what? If I feel right that staying at home is okay, I feel right. If I feel that I can pull a gun and stand at the junction there and let people cook all the meals when they finish, they feed me and I shoot them out, it will feel right. And that will make it right. Pair the argument of the emotive. So we throw that out without looking back at all. It's useless for any meaningful moral or ethical discussion. And just in case you're harboring an emotivist view of, you know, morality, we just showed you how useless such a view would be. Now we'll go to subjectivists. What is the subjectivist view? They accept, look at from the word subject, the person, one, me, myself, and I, okay? Some would want to think of subjectivism in terms of the, uh, the, in, the national person, so Ghana, as a subject, but that is a higher level of subject, or, or religion, so maybe Christianity as a subject, okay, and so that it will look like there are a lot of people, and yet they all represent a body. Now, we want to talk about subjectivism as the name suggests, because there's relativism to take care of the other one. The subject, me, myself, and I, a person, according to the subjectivist, is the measure of all things, is the person that measures right or wrong. What is right or wrong is dependent on the personal, see, persona, personal preference or opinion of the person. What I, I think is right, is right. Those are, <laughs> this is not feelings. See that? The subjectivist accepts that moral claims are stating something that can be true or false. They have a true value. But what they don't agree is that they don't think those claims have objective truth. That is, those claims are not true outside of the person making them. So abortion is evil, for instance. The claim is a moral claim or a moral statement. If I say abortion is evil. For the subjectivist, this abortion is evil claim or killing is wrong eh, is not true all the time for everyone, independently of us. It is true dependent on the person speaking. So he accepts that moral claims are about truth. The only thing is that the truth is measured or determined, if you like, by the subject in question. There again, all the criticisms we raised against emotivism will come up. Our objections against the subject or the subjectivist view is what? How can we blame people for acting in certain ways? Back to the rape example again. The rapist thinks, in his view, he has even done the girl a favor to make her head taste something nice in life. So the girl has suffered that every day orange in choir. Today I made the head taste something. I've done good. If you leave right or wrong to be determined by the subject, then the one the four one nine thinks that he has showed you how to think better by ex exploiting you like that, you know, taking all your money from your account. In his eyes, this is okay. So the problem we'll have if we went subjectivism is what I've told you. How can you blame people for acting in certain ways? You are coming to blame them. By appealing to what? They think it's okay. If we go in subjectivism, that will be the challenge. See that? Those who sent me messages, I'm sure that now you are seeing it. Some will send it. I say, I do read the slide. These are there. I put it there. Read it and see how you can examine the objectivist view. Oh, that, uh, the subjectivist, the emotivist, and whatever, the relativist views, okay? So how can we punish people for performing certain actions? What would be the justification for the punishment? How will you justify your punishment? How can you give someone wrong if he says 2 plus 3 equals 23? You say it's wrong. wrong? Of course, this is not a moral issue. You see that? But uh, just think about it. If it were a moral claim I'm making, you cannot hold me accountable for anything. Insofar as I saw nothing wrong with it, that's what will happen. That is what will happen if we made this subjectivism. See, so we will have no criteria for formulating rules and resolving moral disputes. The key thing is moral. So this shows that subjectivism is not practical. I want to pause before I go to relativism, just in case someone has a question. I see three hands who want to read. That's Genesis, Hilda, and Olivia. As I wait to give them the opportunity to read, do you have any question? Just raise your hand if you have a question. Okay, I don't see a hand up, so we we'll go back. 
there, just in case a hand comes up and it prompts me. Relative response. That's this. Now the relativist response. Look at your screen, please. Immediately, I clarify so that our social work folks, the psycho, you know, sociology, those who study human institutions, even political scientists, to a large extent, those who do culture and like African studies and whatever, don't confuse the facts of cultural difference with what? The, the, the challenge of what? Moral difference. What is right or wrong within contest are not the same. I use several examples. Go to religion. It's okay in a faith, one faith, to have five wives as a man, insofar as you can take care of them, give them their peace of mind, no conflict. It's okay. Acceptable. Okay? But for another, that is not okay. It's a big, huge, big time problem. If you went to even get a girlfriend in addition to your wife, it's so bad for another group of people. Okay, so what? So the differences is not the issue. So difference in culture. I've said all that today. You see that I've repeated it. I should already tell you that it looks like this woman likes that topic. <laughs> okay. So that you prepare for it very well. I know you are good. You do fine. Now listen. The difference is it's not the problem. Cultures are different. No problem at that about that. So cultural relativism only describes the empirical fact of cultural diversity or cultural difference. The fact that people are different doesn't mean what is right or wrong for each culture to must be different. That is difficult to deny. Which one is difficult to deny? Polygamy. I mentioned that. See, some are polygamous, others are not. Some eat rats, others chew grass. I mean, look at the clothing. How we greet, what we consider to be assertiveness, and how some may think that the ladies' act is an as a sign of assertiveness and value. It. Another group will see the ladies' action as rude and proud and disrespectful of men. <laughs> because it's a cultural orientation, the way they do things. So even if you were so sure and wanted to raise your hand for a certain cultural setting. How they do things won't permit you to even sit at that table and discuss. Now, that is what generates the question of ah, but should they behave that way? And look on your screen now. And if the person says, should they behave that way, then ethical relativism response is coming now. Watch. Ethical relativists now will say, please let them decide what is right or wrong. You are not in that culture. Now, what that response I just got is not describing difference. It's going to say you should not see that interfere in how the people want to behave because when it comes to rightness or wrongness, the cultural group must decide that. Now, that is a problem. It will take us back to what we saw in emotivism and what we saw in subjectivism that we have critiqued, projected to, and thrown out. The culture then will determine right or wrong. The religion, the give me an example, that the department, the family. So the family may say that it's okay to pour our WC's waste into the neighbor's drain. That drain that the neighbor taps from for his borehole and feed his household. You don't have an output, you will put it there, and the family says okay. Because they determine what is right or wrong. That's the problem. You see what I'm doing? The lecturer may decide that because she's female and perhaps maybe she has difficulties, blah, 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 blah. All the ladies get a day so that they will be inspired. The brothers don't get a day. That will become okay <laughs> because you are making what is right or wrong dependent on the group in question. It may be cultural, I've told you relativism may be cultural inspired, that's cultural inspired, religion inspired, even ethnic group, or if you like national, national can be Ghana things that this is okay, whereas so and so person thinks another nation thinks it's not okay. If you allowed ethical relativism, that is where it would take us to. So on this slide, we tell you don't commit the naturalistic fallacy. Fallacy means error. 
natural form a naturalistic form the word natural don't confuse what is naturally the case with what what ought to be the case what should don't confuse an ought with an s some more emphasis there see that look on the screen now religion culture social contest epoch civilization interview is the focus of right or wrong ah no there has to be trans cultural values that's what jt says okay so hence for the ethical relative is the last paragraph there there are no moral standards that are different from societal moral groups. They don't distinguish the two. What the society says is right is what is right. And that is problematic. Now I can take Hayat. Hayat, read the current slide for me. We are doing slide number 12. No one can tell me that. Oh, you know, we read some of the things that we didn't understand if it would take us through. I'm virtually doing all the talking and all the discussion again. This time projecting, giving you reference. Hayat, go ahead with this slide. Objection against moral relativism. Objection against ethical or moral relativism. The fact that a culture or society thinks something is right doesn't does not necessarily make it so. It is possible for a whole society to be mistaken about what is right. If Good. there are no moral standards different from societal codes, then when two cultures or culture cultures or societies clash, there will be no standard to resolve the disagreement or conflicts. This may lead to ethics or tribal conflicts since both parties claim to be right. Very good. This is one objection I told you, and yesterday I jokingly told the class on main campus. Uh, the Tuesday group, I said, look, if my religion or my cultural group or whichever group, my, so my, my social setting, wherever I find myself, let's use religion, believes that human beings are sausage, they are food. It means we eat human flesh, suppose so. And your culture doesn't think that it's okay to eat human flesh. In fact, maybe your culture, you are vegetarians. I am right if you visit me and I cut you into pieces and put in my soup, oh, Tom, I am right. By your own argument, you have allowed me to, because you have made it okay for religious groupings. If I, may, I may belong to a cult, we drink human blood. If ethical relativism is okay, then my group, my ethical, excuse me, my cult group are okay looking for human beings' blood to drink. By your argument, you the ethical relativist, you are the first person now pull your blood and drink. Because you say it's okay for everyone to determine what is right or wrong. You see the problem, it has implications. So we may have ethnic, ethnic conflict. It is even impractical. You see, it is even impractical. You can't even determine right and wrong. There will be no objectivity. How do we run society? <laughs> ethically, what will the legal system be doing? What will be the role of the police to arrest who? When I think that I am meaning what my family think that it's okay to tell someone that we have a land for sale, collect money from the person. This my family now, she, and then when we collect it, we use it to take care of our family and buy food and say, When the person comes for the land, they will not give it. Say, ah, but we agree to do no, 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 in our family, we lie. We they will lie, and it's okay for us. So it's right for us to lie. Per the ethical relativist argument, if you were the ethical relative who came to transact with me, you cannot query my action, but you can't do that. That is wrong. Wrong for who? For us, it's right. You see, we'll be stuck. We have to have a higher absolute, that's it. Universal applies everywhere. Objective doesn't depend on the subject in question. Moral standard that we apply to, uh, excuse me, we appeal to, okay, to determine right or wrong. And that is the strength of the traditional view of morality, the one we started with here. That is the strength of this traditional view of what morality, which means it is not relatively, uh, relative, ethically speaking, it's not emotivist, and it is not what subjectivist. I pause for a question if you have any, and we do the second half. We have done all already, but 
we want to be sure. This is slide number 13. Let's see if there's a question. Okay, these are to read. So I'll mop up that one very quickly. Now see, we finished the first half. Now we want to go into now, not only are there moral standards to appeal to, but if we want to measure the specific action that we are going to take, what will we focus on? Will you look at the consequences of the action or the rule grounding that action? What makes an action right or wrong? The consequentialist says, look at the outcome, the consequences of your action to determine whether it is good or what is the output that the action you are going to embark on will make. If the consequences are good, go ahead, regardless of what you did to attain it. So it's as if the end will justify the means. The end is the goal, what, is, what comes out of it, will justify the method you used. That may look like it might be okay to kill to save a life, or perhaps to steal is better. Eh? You, may, you may be doing fine for the consequentialist argument. I'm going to look at the different types, but it might be, be like, it's okay if you, if you stole from the rich, <laughs> you see, you take care of the poor and prevent them from dying. That's what Robin Hood was doing, a storybook called Robin Hood. You can Google and read it. You steal from the rich. Oftentimes, he believes they exploited the system and got that rich. So he will steal from them and feed the poor and foster homes and what have you. Now, that's the consequence-oriented, you know, morality. Those who look out for the consequences. And they say, no, the action must be right in itself. The action must be right in itself. Don't wait and look at the consequences or don't measure the actions, rightness or wrongness by its consequences. Embark on the right action. You need to pay that bit. Now, the three forms of uh, consequentialism. So I had to read again and then I'll take the next person. Forms of consequentialism, I have to Right. Forms of consequentialism. Mm -hmm. It's the idea that an action is right if its consequences maximize or promote one's own personal interest or good, and wrong if its consequence minimized or does not promote the individual interest. So if speaking the truth will put me in trouble, then the right thing for me to do, according to the ethical egoism, is to tell a license that will promote my own good. Very good. What do you think about that? Let me hear, excuse me. Let me hear you. I'm asking the class now, not Hayat. What do you think about that? Mm -hmm. Suppose we were all ethical egoists. <laughs> hmm. Do you want to comment? Uh -uh. Sorry, please. Sorry, please. Someone spoke right now. What do you think? Suppose we were all ethical egoists and Kenya bad crowd. Uh, uh, Would it be a good <laughs> yes, Auntie. It means that you can like to save yourself in the content mm -hmm. or like in in the place that you find yourself. It, it can be no right problem. for you to like. I'm just saying that. What do you think that will be? Will it be a good system to run, morally speaking? Mm -hmm. Where we all do what we think no. benefits us. Mm -hmm. That's a problem. If everybody is doing what will benefit them, ah, someone will be meet the lecturer on the way and slap her so that she will feel dizzy and not come for lecture because he's not prepared for the eye. <laughs> and that will be okay. I'm trying to show you the implications. A lecturer who can collect plenty of cash from people and give them a... Since she'll be accountable, she might just decide that, look, there are 300 students and my grading cannot be all A's for them. So I have 50 A's. I give it to those who gave me big cash. Then I start building a big house. Society will heal me. Hey, go talk, go talk. You know, they give me funds. 
In fact, if I go to a foster home cry and go and give them 3,000 out of the stolen, robbed, exploited money, you see how society will help me. Hey, this one dear, she's not only a good lecturer, she's a giver too. No, I stole the money, auntie. But it will look okay if we went ethical egoism, people, because the ego, me, myself, and I, the person embarking on the act, it looks like, can you see the, some subjectivism there? Yeah. It benefits the ego, the person there. It's okay, it says the egoist. Really? That is not so much, so you can do a criticism of that. You see, I didn't put any critique there. You have to think. Now, what about the altruism, altruistic act? Let me take someone now, else now. Thank you, Ayat. Thank you so much. I want to take <laughs> Genesis now. Genesis, go ahead. Altruism is an idea that an act is right if its consequences benefit others or promotes the well-being of others. Example, being involved in some charity or vol voluntary work. Very good. That's altruism. So the person is altruistic or acted altruistically if his focus is on who? The other person as the benefit, the one who beneficiary, sorry, of an action. So he doesn't focus on himself. See why they are all consequentialists do. They say, look at the consequences as it benefits me. That was the egoism. It will make it right. The other one says, look at the consequences of the action as it benefits other people, not the self, not the one who is performing the act. Then comes the utilitarian view. Genesis, please read the utilitarian view. Utilitarian view is one ethical theory under consequentialism. Its main proponents are Jeremy Betham and S. J. S. Mills. Utilitarianism, an action. An action to be right if it produces the greatest. My lady, the word is the word is eh, utility, usefulness. Eh? So it's utilitarianism. Eh? Utility, usefulness. Eh? Utilitarianism, not all. It's U T I, not U L. Okay, so it's utilitarianism. Go ahead. Utilitarianism, an action to be right if it produces the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people and wrong if it produces the reverse of happiness. Good. It sounds a bit complex. It's not anything we are. The utilitarian view is also a consequentialist. What does it say? It says that what makes an action right is its consequences. You see? But if you leave it like that, then we are not able to tell the difference between this view and the egoist view and the altruism view. You see, because they are all saying it is the consequences. So what is the particular difference that utilitarians add to their view? The utilitarian says, you will do moral philosophy proper eh, in the third year. This is only introductory, so I'm teaching you in a way that gives you a good overview. But not all the details, okay. But there is there's something something I close there, and all that won't go into that. But the utilitarian says an action should be considered what right. If there comes the test, what will make it right? Look at the utility, look at the usefulness of the action. How do you measure that? He says, Oh, check and see if that action produces what a, the greatest. Good. Here we put happiness. Some people put pleasure, pleasing. What is pleasing? Okay, but the good may be happiness for some. Happiness meaning pleasure. What is pleasurable? What is gratifying? Depending on who you are reading. As I said, you can do the details later. But the greatest good for the greatest number of people. If it is giving a lot of good for a few, you are not capturing utility well. 
utilitarianism says what you are doing, that action must give the greatest. So if you compare, it should have the highest good, not just the good being high, but it should benefit many for the greatest number. Okay, that is the standard for measuring the rightness or wrongness of an action. Okay, and so if the opposite will be what? A very bad action. Which one? The one that produces the least happiness or the least good for the least number. Read Genesis, please. Two forms of utilitarianism. Genesis, you are muted, oh. Mm. Act utilitarianism is a view that the rightness or wrongness of an act is determined by the act itself. If the act produces at least a great balance of happiness over unhappiness in its consequences for all people, for all people than any other available act, then it is right. Act, uti act utilitarianism considers only the results of single acts. Would you like to continue? I want you to read it. That's how I projected it. Go on. Okay. Um, two, rule, uti rule utilitarianism is a view that an action is right if it is in the conformity to a rule which maximizes the great the greatest happiness for the great number. Rule utilitarianism considers the consequences the consequence that results from following a rule or conduct. You see? So here again, they are all I'm muting it. Genesis, I think you have a feedback. That's why I keep in shape when you are not talking. Listen, they are all looking at the consequences from egoism to altruism to now what? Utilitarianism. We studied the utilitarian view, or we, start, we, we looked at what makes a, a view utilitarian. Then we are now looking at two ways of thinking of utilitarianism. See? The act utilitarian view. It means the focus is on the action itself. Is the view, see, see, the view that the rightness or wrongness of an act is determined by the act itself. You measure the action's impact in generating the greatest good, the greatest number. So I look at the action and what it did. What did the madam say? If the act produces at least a great balance of happiness over unhappiness and its consequences for all people than any other available act, then it is right. So you are measuring the action that I embarked on to tell whether it generated a greater good over evil, okay? I look at that single act, you see? So think of it like today, maybe I told a lie, but it saved, Ghana. Look at Rahab in the Bible. Let's just use that. Those who do Bible, eh? Rahab, the, the prostitute that hid the two spies from, from uh, Israel that went to Jericho to spy the land and come and tell Joshua and the people. Okay, if you don't know it, just Google Rahab. But she was a prostitute. And because prostitute hosts men of all types and all places, and she kept her house in the wall, the city wall of Jericho, a very fortified city. That she lived at the think of it at the junction. So when uh, strangers, new people come to town, she would de detect them. They remember what she is, a prostitute. So she will she will have certain things available for guys to come. Now, why am I using that watch? She told a lie when the city folks came and said some two men have come here. Apparently, they are spies to come and check on that place, the Americans. They are, we are America. They are coming to check so that they go and tell the people who want to throw bombs at us or something. So it is a serious matter. Treasonable if you hide it. Mm -hmm. But the woman saw that these people are powerful and God's hand is on them. She is a prostitute. She says, 
I'm helping you. If you go and you are coming to destroy this land, tell your, tell your God, or I mean, uh, blah, 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 to save me, my household. And the people went to compact with them. Now, what am I interested in? She told a lie, one act, that single act. If you were measuring it, perhaps, perhaps I say, by the utilitarian view, to save the whole nation for this, she wasn't an Israelite. But she saved nation by her single act. The act utilitarian will measure her light early. Perhaps so. As what? Good. Why? Because it generated the greatest good for the greatest land. For you. For Israel. What about Jericho? We'll see the particular. See? So the line will be okay. That act will be okay for, for this instance. That's act utilitarian. The focus is on that act. Now, what about rule utilitarian? The rule utilitarian view is still utility, measuring the greatest good for the greatest number. But what does it do? It's a view that an action is right if it is in conformity to a rule. See what they are doing? It maximizes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. So here too, you're looking at the action, but the action as it obeys the rule, the moral rule. <laughs> That's why you can criticize these two folks. They are, they are confused. Do you want to do rule or you want to do act? Actions. Are you looking at the consequences or you are looking at the rule? Because you are utilitarian. You said we should focus on consequences. Now you can see that there are certain things that will go wrong if we were just focused on the consequences. So we don't know if you want to come and join can't to do the ontology or not. <laughs> That's our problem. We don't know what you are doing. Should we go rule or consequences? You people see consequences. So we follow you to your house. Now inside the consequentialist sect, you say the bedroom is the utilitarian. We'll go there. When we get into the utilitarian, I say, oh, we, cry. we should have gone to the other building. But I thought that one is the ontology. They are now in consequence. The rule utilitarian is trying to incorporate moral rules as a guide to the action that is generating what? The maximum good for the greatest number. So the rule utilitarian is criticized that you, we are not sure whether you are doing consequentialism or you want to do deontology, which is the next one, okay? But I say you, you, you delve a bit more into all those when you do moral philosophy. Moral philosophy is level 300, it's not even 200, we are now in level 100. Just set bits to make your life easier if you are with us then and you take the core, it's a core. Now listen, so how will you distinguish rule utilitarian from act utilitarianism. The rule utilitarian view says that you measure an action to tell whether it is right or wrong by checking how that action conforms to a rule, that's a moral rule, eh? which maximizes the greatest happiness for the greatest number. The action, therefore, must have morality in it, must obey the moral principle in the bid to do what? Maximize the greatest good for the greatest number. Rule utilitarianism considers the consequence that results from following a rule of conduct. You see what I said? So are you doing deontology now? Or you are looking at consequences? Or you want to eat your cake and still have it? Is it a blend of the two when you reflect in your later years, you can query that. Very good. Now some problems with consequentialist view, and I want to take Olivia now. Thank you so much, Genesis. I had to read it. Yeah, we take Olivia. I see Hilda. I see Abdurrahman. I see Zainab. Go ahead, Olivia. Problem consequentialist ethics. We can. Can we always measure the full consequences of an action? What are the rights of the minority? Is the screen gone? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, I mistakenly did that. I'll get it back. Give me a minute. Oh dear, I've closed it. So we'll use some few minutes, but let's reflect. Just think about it, everyone. How are we able to measure the full consequences of our actions? How? You think that you are killing one to save 99. So the ship is sinking or the boat is sinking. So you kill one person because out of weight, of course. It is sinking because the thing is heavy. So you think that, oh, by the consequentialist view, let's say utilitarianism specifically, you can kill one. You are not happy about it, but if it will generate the greatest good for the greatest number, then it's okay. Let's drop one person out of the boat so that we can save the 99 lives. So you do that. It will look okay by the consequentialist theory, right? Until we find out that it was that one person alone that has the cure for COVID, which made us run into the boat to go and hide ourselves somewhere. Now that one person is the only person whose blood could have been mixed with the river water for everyone to drink from and be what? Well, everyone, including the whole world, we were concerned about 99 people. Now the whole world, billions of us are going to die. Was your measurement of the consequences earlier correct? It looked correct, 99 versus what they <laughs> will go for 99 and drop the one. But now, Upon hindsight, when you compare 99 versus billions of people, the greatest good for the greatest number, you see that you would have aired. What is the critique then? It is not easy. We can't always measure the full actual consequences of our action, especially in the long term. Since I read a second, I think it, it's back now. What? What of the right of the minority? The minority may be harmed or ignored at the expense of the majority. Would that be just after all? Would we not undermine humanity by using others as a means to an end? Sacrificing Very important. The Hold on. OK, you finish that one. Sorry, finish it so that I can talk to all. OK. Sacrificing the benefits of others to please the majority, killing one to save 99. For example, when a boat is sinking because of weight. Now that is the problem. Look at it. What about the minority? Let's say that a certain group, tribal, ethnic, whatever, in Ghana are ignored, we say that, well, they can go to hell. They can be hungry the whole time. We don't care. After all, they are just a small number. Let's say Ghana is 35 million, suppose. <clears throat> then there are only two ethnic groups, just for assumption's sake. OK, or better us so there are 20 ethnic groups. But the predominant ones add up to 30 million. And the 5 million left are the other 19 left. But if you count all of them and put them together, they're just <laughs> 5 million. When we are making decisions for the nation and we want to go strictly consequentialist or even a specific type, the don't uh, the utilitarian view, do you realize what will happen? We don't care. It will be right so far as the majority are benefiting. Why? Because the greatest good for the greatest number. So the good may be a high one. Our focus is the number of people that have benefited. That's all. What happens to the rights of the minority? It won't matter. That's a challenge. We may harm them. We may even say, look, they cry for you destroy them craft from this nation will be better off. 
we may ignore them at the expense of the majority. Would that be just? Is that the conception of justice we have? Plato says, reflect. That's not just. So consequentialism can generate such injustice. I could ask you a question like that. In examining the consequentialist view, give practical illustrations to show whether justice can be can prevail or not, something like that. Let your references include politics, law, international relations, what have you. You see, I can ask you things like that. It will generate a problem of justice if all we are looking at is how many people benefited from that good that we created. Now, if you read Bentham and Mill, I don't know if I've touched on that ahead. Maybe I have. If not, you know that Bentham focuses on what? Quantity, the quantity of the good. So he's measuring the good in terms of quantity. The greatest good is how much. While for J.S. Mill, the greatest good is measured in terms of what? Quality, the quality of it. Depending on who you are reading, if it is all because we want to give the greatest good to the greatest number, and we went Bentham's way, for example, then we'll just keep pouring water inside. Oh, free. we'll say free SHS, free SHS. we'll put plenty of water in that one soup, a soup that you serve only maybe 10 children. We can put a bucket, two buckets of water inside, and you to serve 100 children. And we say we are feeding plenty of people. <laughs> Where is the quality then? <laughs> you see, our nutrition can hurt. So if you go only consequences of a certain, as for the egoism and the altruism, they are worse off. Uh, excuse me, excuse me. Egoism is worse off. Altruism may be fine. Even though that has been criticized, I told you in class, that an altruistic act ultimately benefits the person who performed it. It's still egoistic. <laughs> okay, so think around that. Then the third point still, uh, I mean, pulled from the initial point is that what? the dignity of the human person will be undermined. You will matter so far as you are not part of the majority. You will be, you will be a, a, a means to an end. You will matter per such in a vegetarian view. I hope you are following from wherever you are, okay? Your dignity, your dignity, like we saw in informed consent, must not be conditioned upon your association or your belongingness. You are a human person. And your views, your autonomy, your entitlement must be accorded you. So we don't ignore it because you're in a minority. If it is something entitled to, you can use others as a means to an end. This is a language that Immanuel Kant, who is a deontologist, he doesn't look at the consequences. He wants you to look at the moral imperative, categorical imperative. Look at it. Is it right? Okay, he he says you do because we don't use human beings as a means to attain another end. Human beings are an end. So if you're a human person, you are an end in yourself. Whether you have money or not, rich or poor, educated or not, a human being has dignity because of your nature, what you are. It's not conditioned upon anything, and therefore we shouldn't use you as a means to attain money, as a means to attain relationship, as a means, like I told you, don't let the mistaken pregnancy, don't use that to say, therefore, you must get this. Whatever you are using that to get makes the child, who is a human being, less valuable. Okay, and so Khan says, if we pursue such, we will be using people as means, so why should you kill one to save 99? That one is not worth, 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 worth. does it have moral worth? Is that the point? That's the challenge. Uh, and so it takes us to one question that puts us in the frame of what business ethics. All that we have heard, we'll now look at some question, a reflection question, and then we'll do the second half. We have just four slides left on this and then we are so done. Let me take, thank you very much, Olivia. Genesis, you may put your hand down, Olivia, you too. Now I can take. Hilda, then I see Abdurrahman, Zainab, and Ezekiel. 
Go ahead, Hilda. Pause and reflect. A multinational pharmaceutical company is faced with the ethical dilemma of telling the general public the truth about a mishap in the company's drug labeling, which has resulted in the death of four unborn children and leaves many more at risk if the drugs are not retrieved from the market immediately. But the challenge the company faces is that admitting this truth could attract crippling legal charges, drastic reduction in patronage, and reputation crisis. As a consultant, give a respond ethical advice to the company, showing clearly the ethical basis of your advice, the challenge or challenges you envisage, and how to deal with the identified challenge or challenges. Very good. I want feedbacks from you. Does anybody want to suggest something? Just unmute and react. I won't say anything. This is a past question. Those who have, have seen some of my past questions, you saw it there. It's a past question. Anybody wants to react? You cannot just unmute and react. <coughs> Oh, nobody. If you were the ethical consultant, what will you tell them? I see four hands up. Should I call anybody? Okay, let's continue. So you can reflect on it. Now we can do the ontology. I'm just saying that, look, the thing is a multinational pharmaceutical company. It's not just one branch. It belongs to different niche. I mean, they have <laughs> institutions in different nations. It's multinational. That's what that means. Multiple nations hosted. Think of Goyle. Think of this. This one is a pharmaceutical one. They are selling different drugs. Mm -hmm. It's not just this one that had a drug labeling issue they labeled it wrongly it's just one of their drugs will you go into the public and tell the world we mislabeled our drugs so would that be the ethical thing to do what are the implications the fear that grandma will now have and so her diabetic drug which was not affected at all but was produced by that company Will she wear mind? Will she even drink it? Aren't we putting grandma's life at risk because of the lack of trust you have? What about the workers? Think about it. What about the many people who can die from that decision to make it public? If you don't make it public, how do you retrieve the drugs? <laughs> because it's killing. Can you face the legal charges that comes with it? You may even be instructed to close down and not produce drugs for many people. Think around that. The children that were, were uh, had to die before they were born, think about it. Do you know what they were going to be? So it's a dilemma, a decision-making time that requires reflection, philosophical reflection, that looks out for the various aspects of the matter. It's not a one-way traffic thing. It's not just the legality of it. If it's the legality, you close your mind about the ethics, whether it's right or wrong, let them die a little. After a while, all, the, all of them will die. The drugs will finish, then we'll continue. Really? No. If you admit this truth, crippling legal charges, drastic reduction in patronage, and reputation crisis, which has implications. They worked. Something that happened maybe in, uh, go for big, Ghana's branch. It's affecting all the 38 or so branches <laughs> with huge, 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 you know, network spread over the nations. What should you do? You are a consultant. They give you big money, ethical consultant. 
give a reasoned ethical advice to the company, showing clearly the basis. What we are interested in is what I'm telling you. What will be your basis of that advice? Then soon I will be generally advise the company. What will be the grounds, the justification you offer for whichever advice you're giving? And I, I make it fair that I clarify it a bit more fair. I say the challenge you envisage, you are giving a certain advice. You already have to look out for what the possible difficulty will be with that advice. And how do you advise the company to deal with that challenge? You say this one is written in a certain book anyway. It's not written. And take all the textbooks to the lecture. Example. We don't know. We don't know. What I'm looking for is not in a book. It's in you. Brilliant human being, you. You think and solve life problems, of course. But you connect it to the theorizing that we've done so that dedication will matter. So you reflectively respond. When I did that in class, for certain, I think it was last year's sessions, we had some very brilliant input. And some say, okay, doc, then we could do like, a, we are doing a promotion. They will say, oh, we'll get, 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 buy one, get one free or something. We are doing a promotion to rebrand our, this, this, we are trying to get all our drugs back. If you then, then, then bring the drugs, we'll give you this or that, something like that. Something to inspire people to now go looking for the drug off the shelves and bring them. Think about it. We haven't announced, but we are correcting our mistake and we are doing it promptly. Someone could say, we, we will just pretend that I said, well, why are you doing it? We'll pretend that it's not us. <laughs> Think around it. Let's do the last lap. Hell, I'll go ahead with this one. Now. Deontology. Kantianism. Rule or duty based ethics. Deontology. From the Greek word deon, meaning duty. It is the ethical theory proposed by Immanuel Kant. The theory claims that what makes an action right is that it satisfies certain rules or duty and wrong if the action is contrary to the rules or duty. Here, the rules are to be obeyed not because they maximize utility, but because they have intrinsic value or are good in themselves. The theory holds that actions are determined by their intrinsic value, hence consequences do not matter. What matters here is one's intentions or reasons for performing the action. So do what is right based on rules or duty, regardless of the outcome. Excellent. Read it very well. I don't have to add much. Listen. We have talked consequences sir, until we had Immanuel Kant. Is Immanuel is with an I, okay? Capital I. Take note of that. Not E. What did Kant say? Kant and others like him who think that it is not the consequences, <clears throat> excuse me, that determines whether an action is right or wrong. Do the right thing. How? We have already gone through universalism. You see that universal statement, excuse me, a, a universal principle, absolute objective. Kant may be appealing to something like that to tell you. Will that your action suffice, qualify to be called a universally applicable action? Suppose you want to tell a lie now to save a life. You don't know if telling the lie. It's right or wrong. The consequentially says, look at what will come out of it. That's how I do it. Oh, if I tell this lie, I'll save the guy. The consequence that, then that's okay. Go ahead. It's right. Then Kant is standing at the other side and looking at you. He says, boss, would you want us to make this telling of lie a 